Richard Skipper celebrates. Every show is a celebration. Richard Skipper celebrates the best in entertainment. Each show, Richard delivers the artists you love, showcasing what makes them unique, never gossipy. The antidote to a sometimes hectic world. Now, here's your host, Richard Skipper. Happy Tuesday, everyone. And welcome to the latest edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. For those of you who are here for the first time, welcome. Uh, my show is all about celebrating. It's about celebrating life, celebrating art, celebrating artists, celebrating whatever it is that we can find to celebrate right now. And today, for those of you who are wondering, it's All Souls Day. Uh, it's the Day of the Dead, uh, which is not something to mourn but to celebrate those who have gone before us. I had a wonderful mentor when I was a kid, uh, Miss Florence Epps. Uh, she was the one who inspired me to go into the theater. And she always taught me that when I went into the theater, that every time I stepped on stage or every time I stepped before the camera, that I was carrying the mantle of everyone who went before me on my shoulders. And that it behooved me, as she always used to say, to always think of them. And I always think of all those great artists that have gone before me uh, when I step before the camera. And whether they be living or dead, I always think of them. I also think back to 1979, the year that I came to New York. And when I came to New York in 1979, shortly thereafter, in 1980, Brigadoon magically appeared in New York once again, and Meg Bussert's name was all over New York. And I had the great fortune of seeing her in Brigadoon. And when our mutual friend, Susan Schulman, reached out to me recently and said, how would you like to have her on the show? Um, I didn't have to think twice. I am so thrilled that you were here, Meg. Uh, I want to look back, not only at your career, uh, but to talk about what's going on in your life right now. Um, I don't know whether I should call you Meg or Professor, uh, because you've got so many uh, great titles that you wear. Uh, but before we jump in, I want to say welcome. And what are you celebrating right now? Oh. I am celebrating grandmotherhood. That's a good thing to celebrate. <laughs> yes. Uh, how many grandchildren do you have? I have two at the moment and uh, two children. And uh, one is married and therefore those two. And then another uh, child is getting married very soon. So we'll see what's in the offing. Congratulations. And how old are the grandchildren, if you don't mind my asking? Yes. And three. Wow, great age to be. You know, I asked you just before we went live, um, and it was last minute, um, if I could have a photograph of you at five years old, and it was last minute, so we don't have that. But the reason I asked for that photograph is because I always like to go back to the five-year-old self. Because to me, the five-year-old self is the purest self. Uh, it's the self before school starts, uh, before peer pressure, uh, before the pressure of teachers, uh, your teacher yourself, uh, before teachers start uh, informing who we should or should not be. Uh, I know that you were born in Chicago. Uh, did you also grow up in Chicago? Uh, and uh, tell us a little bit about the five-year-old Meg and who and what you were all about at that age. Well, at five, I was probably in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, my father worked there in the DC area. Mm -hmm. And so I think we moved back to, the, I was born in the Chicago area in Evanston. And uh, then we moved back when I was going into third grade, I think. 
think it was, anyway, uh, into back to Chicago. So my five-year-old self was definitely uh, in, in Arlington, Virginia. And um, yeah. And what was your father's profession? He worked for the government. That's what all I could say. So um, yeah, it was, uh, um, they used to say that he worked for the Navy, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I went, I went to St. Saint, uh, Saint James School, um, which was like down the road. And we lived in a, uh, you know, an apartment kind of set up. Um, and uh, there was a little playground in the back and all of the children around the same age would meet in the little playground and complain about our parents. And actually, um, now that you mention it, at five years old, six years old, we would put on plays on our little backyard porch, the kids in the neighborhood. Interesting. Hmm. Now, do you remember where that idea came from? I mean, was, I mean, where did the spark first begin for you uh, of play acting? Most children do play act, uh, but very, I mean, most grow beyond that. Uh, but a few of us hold on to that and yeah. we continue into adulthood, thank God. Uh, but, um, you know, where did that spark come from for you originally? It From my father, absolutely. He was, um, uh, there was even a musical about this kind of thing. My father was a uh, an excellent musician, but he was uh, not a trained musician. He kind of picked it up and he had a band after World War II. He got together a bunch of vets and they, they, just, this, they did this musical not recently. It was him. He would, he would, then they would play all the churches, you know, and it was about eight or 10 guys. And um, so he would conduct everything. He didn't read music very well, but he could hear everything. He loved the big band sound so that I grew up hearing that. And he loved Broadway. I don't know why. So I grew up not so much at five, but uh, the music was always around me. And I was always singing um, Julie Andrews and Barbara Cook and anything that they, that they bought, brought as, as I got older. And, and your mom, was she artistic as well? Yeah, she was quite a singer herself, and there was uh, music in the background. But, you know, she was mother of seven, so she was an at-home mom. And then later she had her own business with that. But, yeah, there was always a lot of music. And um, we, you know, had to take piano, whether we wanted to or not. It was forced <laughs> on us. And we fought, most of us, you know. Um, but, yeah, that was absolutely really important. Yeah. And do you, I mean, when was the first time that your family uh, or even yourself realized that you had this gift that was beyond just singing around the house, if you will, uh, that you did have this special gift? I think it was junior high and high school. I mean, it was, it was in, it was all kind of one seamless thing. And I found a whole bunch of other young folks who loved music too. And we were always in those days, it was the vinyl. We would, we would sing the orchestra. We would sing, you know, da, 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 Oklahoma. We would sing all the parts of the, you know, and I, I mean the music, not the words. And um, we, um, we memorized everything. I do a great, I do a real mean semoir, let me tell you. Um, <laughs> we sang absolutely everything. And then there was a moment, um, probably in early high school, where my music choral teacher said, you're really singing those things well. And I said, yeah, I sing them all the time. He said, yeah, but that's unusual that you're singing those things well, as well as you are. And uh, so I went, oh, huh. So then I, you know, pestered my mom. I want some voice lessons. So, um, yeah, I got very, very involved in it. And I began to not only have fun, but to learn a little bit about it. And in those days, there were no programs, you know, that one could go to in college. Mm -hmm. um, in the middle of Illinois, it was like, you know, there was something called um, communication arts that were, you know, very big in the Midwest, speech making and debate and all of that. And then drama and music was like, you know, uh, an, an addendum to all of that. So um, um, I started studying that and, you know, did that for four years at the University of Illinois and then didn't graduate because I kept changing my majors. <laughs> all the time. Um, and then, you know, two hundred dollars in a duffel bag and my sewing machine and went off to New York. So. Uh, so what was the deciding factor to bring you to New York? Um, just everyone who was around me said, don't do it. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, they said, it's a really hard life. And these were these were the teachers, the music teachers. Um, uh, they just said, it's it's a very hard life. And you, you know, you you don't know how hard it is until you get out there and try it. And, and uh, you know, and I keep saying, well, let me go out there and try it. <laughs> 
what's the big deal? So, um, and being the oldest of seven, you know, I was ready to get out. And um, of course, uh, you know, I didn't, you know, as far as I was concerned, Chicago was tiny, tiny, tiny. And uh, New York was the Mecca. I didn't even know that word then, but I knew I had to go there. Uh, oh, I'm the oldest of four. So I I think it's the oldest child syndrome that you both, uh, both of us had. Yes. Uh, and I, you know, but I grew up in a small town. It was like, I've got to get out of here no matter what, I've got to go. Um, did you have any opportunities? Uh, did you do any theater at all in Chicago before you made not, it to New York? Yeah, not professionally. No, um, all, it was all school oriented and all that kind of stuff. So it was a huge jump but again there that's what people did then there were no programs you couldn't go and study you know um musical theater definitely uh you could study theater maybe but uh it was not a bfa programs were you know just beginning in new york around that time in the 70s um so this was um I don't know. It was like, you know, that what's that old song? I'm just a little girl from Illinois, and I just have to go out there and. and so try. you and I pretty much arrived in New York, give or take, within the same period. Uh, New York was a very different animal mm -hmm. in the '70s. Mm -hmm. um, so when, where, and how did you make that move? Did you know anyone when you got here? Uh, where did you stay, and what did you do to survive when you first arrived in New York? Well, I had an aunt and uncle who lived in uh, Yorktown Heights, which is just north of the city. So I crashed with them. They also had a burgeoning family and it was younger. And about the third month, my aunt was saying, so how much longer are you going to hang around with this? You know, I had been going into the city for auditions. And I, at that point, you know, uh, I started getting callbacks for things. Mm -hmm. And um, so I found somebody I was working at a, um, what's it, the first job was probably a waitressing kind of thing it was uh met another young girl who was also trying it out and she had a friend who had a uh, um a studio so the three of us lived in a studio and uh it was a nice building so we felt quite safe but there were three of us in there and um you know that that went on for um a while uh i was uh working non-equity things um for 15 dollars a week Mm -hmm. Somehow that was okay, and uh, and was auditioning at, and the open calls for things. And I, again, I was getting response, which I was was surprised at. You know, I would I would sing my "How Are Things in Guacamora" in a higher key. Mm -hmm. He was, and I had a good fake Irish accent, so I threw that in, and they liked that. And then they always asked me for something else. Um, and uh, and then eventually I was hired on a chorus of an equity show, Lolita, my love. And that was about four months into into my stay in New York. So I was kind of picked up quickly. Um, the, I do recall that there were 600 women auditioning for the, the singing chorus of Lolita, my love. The callbacks were 90 women. And this was at the Mark Hellinger Theater, all mm -hmm. of years. And so out of the 90, um, they, they um, yeah. You know, I was one of eight singers that were hired, and then there were eight dancers, women. You know, I did so. It was a course of thirty-two. Um, and that was was, but you, you don't consider that your first big break in New York, or do you? I do, Richard. I do because um, I understood even then what people were telling me that the profession was way different than Maine South High School theater. And um, it, it, you know, I luckily fell in with uh, some older folks who kind of said, this kid's from the Hicks and uh, kind of took care of me. Some really wonderful dancer guys and some wonderful men and women singers. And I was one of the mm -hmm. younger singers and I could also move very well. So I um, wasn't a dancer, but I could move well. And so I, when they, they needed an augmentation in the dance chorus, there was about three or four of us that were you know, thrown in. So then I got to learn, oh gosh, I got to get more training here because <laughs> I can sort of do it, but I don't know what they're talking about when they started mm -hmm. talking Sinead turns, you know, plea. And I mean, what is happening? So um, <laughs> I, I learned there and then I also learned what an out of town tryout was. And what an out of town tryout was with, with two major writers, John Barry and, and, um, uh, Alan J. Lerner mm -hmm. uh, on a flop, and it was it was a it was an astounding astounding experience, and um, I could go on for an hour on that. 
And then, well, I mean, well, you know, well, let's talk about that for just a moment before we move on. What are some of the life lessons that you learned from that show so early on in your career? Uh, because, I mean, some people come along, they end up in a show and it ends up being a major hit. And they think uh, that is going to be everything that's going to happen with them. Um, yesterday, I spoke with Julie Halston and uh, early on, she said, their early work, she thinks this is going to be everything. And it's not always that case. Uh, but you had this experience to start out on. And uh, it's not always the case. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I learned, um, I learned a lot about the unions. I learned a lot about uh, writing. I learned a lot about um, how, to, how to rehearse a whole new scene, a whole new material and do the other, the, what was already rehearsed at night. Um, uh, and I learned that it doesn't always have a happy ending, you know, and it was, uh, and the story was Lolita. It was yes. musicalizing Lolita. And I was a few years older than Lolita, the girl playing Lolita. And it was like, this is weird. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. So uh, even, even to, at that point, yes. So it, it kind of opened my eyes. I don't know that I learned all that much, but I was, my eyes were open for the next few shows that I got that I went, Oh, Oh, cause the next thing I got was a, a, a very successful tour of applause with Lauren McCall. So that was like success. You know, that's what it's like when you walk in, you're in a, a big uh, successful with the star and you go into Chicago and LA and Houston and all these great places and everybody thinks you're wonderful and there's parties and there's all these things. Then I went into, you know, Irene, Avatan Triad Irene, which was gonna be eight weeks and turned out to be 16 weeks. And it was a total mess, but it was so wonderful. Well, uh, well, I want to talk about both of those experiences with you. First of all, you're in applause, major uh, star like Lauren Bacall, um, and lessons that you learn from working with someone such as Lauren Bacall, uh, life lessons, I call them, uh, that you learn both as an artist uh, and as a human being that you've carried through the rest of your life and career. Uh, she was definitely the star star. I mean, absolutely. She was. Um, she made sure, though, that every town that we hit, that if there was a party, it was not a principal's only party. She just made sure that everyone was invited, and she made it quite clear. Um, but there was also, uh, she would only, if there was a restaging or, um, you know, they, there was a wonderful lift uh, when they went to the gay bar and she sang with all the boys and they, she, they, they kind of lifted her and turned her around and all this stuff. Um, there, the, the dance captain would do the warm up and the rehearsals and if there was a change and she would come in at the last minute and the, um, you could see the, um, the attention and the, the, uh, all their bodies went, as soon as she walked in, they were relaxed and doing it all with the dance captain and, you know, she was comfortable. And then, and um, Betty wasn't all that comfortable. So, so she would mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, uh, clutch and they had to be ready for that adjustment because they had to be. And that was never talked about, but it was so evident watching them. Mm -hmm. And what I used to do is just, and, and I did this through all of my early times is hang out in the wings and watch them. You know, what, what, the, all the principals did was amazing because they, once they were on stage, the way they, their characters came out of their persona and their, their absolute awareness of the audience response all the way through and how to time a lap, how to time anything, you know, if there's applause that breaks in or if somebody, something happens. Um, one of the most amazing things, opening night of applause in Chicago, we didn't do the second act because there was a, problem with uh one of the, the the flats that came down which almost hit her <laughs> and so they shut down the entire show and we're like <gasps> and and something needed fixing and they just said we we're not doing that too so go to the party you know and so that was that was written up you know and and they fixed it and everything but they were not gonna they were absolutely not gonna take any chances at all and then with i uh with irene the stories are legendary about sir john gilgood as the director. Uh, your memories of the transitional period of him moving on and then Gower Champion taking over. Well, we had a, um, yeah, it was, um, you know, I love Shakespeare, I studied Shakespeare. So to have Sir John Gilgood there, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, and other people going, and a musical. 
Um, <laughs> yes. Got that later, but uh, he he brought um, a really marvelous touch and um, probably uh, pistache, pastiche, pastiche, that kind yes. of uh, yes. called up the time. Our uh, one number that all the um, the ladies did uh, with Ruth Warwick, which was underneath the branches of our spreading family tree, it was all the girls in the in the the girl all girls school, and we we came out in um, a nineteen. 19 tennis outfits really cute and then with mm -hmm. tennis rackets and we did all sorts of movement stuff and sang it you know in very delicate little we were and uh, we were called rosebuds that's what the nickname of the, the ladies ensemble um and it when gower came in um we had been working with with uh peter Gennaro as our choreographer and loved him we all loved peter and when it was announced gower champion was coming in to to take over and you know, redo, um, we all, oh my God, what's going to happen to Peter? You know, because Gower Champion is a choreographer director. Well, the first meeting that we had with Gower is he came out and he said, just want to let you know, Peter is the choreographer remaining the choreographer. I may choreograph a little transitional stuff, but I'm here to focus, to refocus the show around Debbie, around Irene, and, you know, tell a little more. Um, so uh, we, we did a lot of the, um, you know, from Hello Dolly, a lot of what we used to call the mm -hmm. waiter gallop, you know. Yeah. So the the transition from one scene to another was always choreographed, and it was so wonderful. And then the transition would end, and then Peter's choreography would come up, and it was so it, that was a touching and meaningful moment to see what I would have in my youth thought, oh well, they're you know they're competitors and they're going to be at each other, not at all. And that was like, wow, you know, we can all kind of get together when we. Mm -hmm. get um, it was it was really wonderful. Um, one silly little thing that happened is as Gower did come in and he was working very fast and he needed to change um, something. And we were all on stage and he was getting names left and right, of course. And there was one tall, very young, gorgeous dancer lady who was a rockette. So she was going to be later. She was going to be one of the uh, models that comes out. And um, but he could never remember her name and he loved the way she moved and he kept saying um oh in the red i'm sorry what's your name she said arlene so he went and then he did something says oh yes um mm, mm, in the red arlene you know and then the third time that he moved her around you know she's he said i am just so sorry i can't keep your name in my head she said that's all right grover <laughs> this is our champion and she's really? calling him grover dale he thought that was the funniest thing he ever heard in his life he totally guffawed he stopped the rehearsal and then i had it had to be explained to me <laughs> but it was no, i did a lot of research um on uh gower when i was uh researching dolly and uh he had you know in in my research and there's a wonderful book uh called before the parade passes by uh by uh, john anthony gilvey i uh, i don't know if you've read the book uh but um he had a phobia also about people being behind him uh, when he was rehearsing. Um, do you have any recollections or memories of that in the rehearsal process? No, not not of that particular thing. I do know that he he could go like this, and we would hear it. Mm -hmm. No matter how much noise was going on and everything, he wouldn't yell and he wouldn't ding ding anything like some. Unquote, to stop the noise or hold and then have the stage manager go hold um he would just make this little clicking noise with his, and we would you know all it was kind of stunning but no i, I did not know that about him mm -hmm. hmm. and then you know and eventually you're moving on and you are a bona fide broadway star yourself with brigadoon um if you can take us to that moment when you uh, find out that you're going to be carrying a Broadway show yourself and the the excitement of that moment in your life. Well, I had um, started um, taking over understudies, mm -hmm. which was a, an, another huge step in in and, and Irene, too. I was in the wings. Debbie threw me out of the wings because it made her crazy because I would I was like this. And then I went off and did Irene on a bus and truck and did everything that Debbie did. Mm -hmm. I got rave reviews on how brilliant my choices were, but they were all Debbie's. But no one knew that in the bus of truck, you know. So, um, so I had practiced being a leading lady in my head, and um, you know, being able to go on as an understudy. 
when you go on the first time, everyone's there and behind you, and it's you have so much support. And then you go on the second or third time, they're oh, she knows it, and all of a sudden. Well, do you mind if I interrupt you for just a moment? I apologize for doing so, but um, if you can talk about the mindset for a moment for those who are watching uh, about being a standby, uh, being an understudy, uh, the audience obviously is there to see Debbie Reynolds or to see Jane Powell, uh, and then it's announced that you're going on. Um, someone wrote. I read a very interesting article the other day. Um, Burt Bacharach uh, said the reason that he did not have another big Broadway musical after Promises, Promises, very interesting, was that Richard Rogers went to see Promises, Promises. Um, the day that he went, most of the orchestra were substitutes. Then someone wrote that they went to see Hamilton recently and five of the principals were out of the show and they were standbys, and yet they were charging the same price, and he felt gypped. And my response to that was that if you feel that these people are less than, uh, it's not fair to them because they've also paid their dues, uh, and the powers that be would not be putting them on if they were not up to the job. Okay. And I feel very strongly about that as an actor myself, uh, so I'm sure knowing that you've been in that position and addressing those that are watching now about what that experience is like for the person who does go on in that position. And, you know, so if you can address that, please. Yeah, I, I didn't understudy Debbie. I was understudying J uh, Janie Sell, which was a, there were three women in, in one of them. And I did go on for her a fair amount. But um when you're when you're rehearsing it, you're usually rehearsing with the stage manager, not the the original director, and they put you through um, your regular acting things are kind of up to you. What they're doing is giving you the traffic and giving you what the star or the other principals will be expecting from you. So if it's a timing issue, uh, when I was understudying an, uh, an English, an older English lady at, at age 24 in in uh, Lorelei, I was um, taught that I had to bring the tiara out of my handbag and hand it to um, uh, Carol. 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 Hand it to Carol before the laugh started because she thought the funny part was was when she put it on her head. And the funny part was really the reveal of the tiara out of the bag. We all knew this. So mm -hmm. he said, you gotta give it to her quick so that she can get it on her head before the laugh starts. That's how I was trained <laughs> to do that. So all of a sudden, you know, that took away from me the uh, the freedom of finding my own timing and working with another actor. So it's an, it's an odd kind of thing. Each shows are different. Each person you understudy is very different. But what it trains you and it, it keeps your, it's like swinging for a dancer or a singer who has to go on for 15 different people. Um, you know, what is expected? Where do I need to be at a certain time? And, and what is, so the more you go on as an understudy, the more you can kind of create your own moment. But if you're on and then you're off for another through two, three weeks and then you're on, and you're, it's a very stressful kind of thing. And uh, it's not as though you're walking into owning the character because that's not your job. Your job is to keep to keep the show going and mm -hmm. to keep everyone else. And they're, they're and usually they help you, you know, and, and they want you to, to, you know, but then what I was explaining is they, if they've been on with you for several times and they think you're cool, and you're okay. They begin to relax. So you don't get what you've gotten before. So it's, you know, uh, it's a, it's a, an a interruptive kind, but that's training. That's theater. It's live theater. It's what it's about. And I think to go back to your original question, when I finally got the role, I was so relieved because I knew that I was going to be able to work with the director and the other people. We were all cast together and we were going to be able to build something together. Um, and someone was going to understudy me. And mm -hmm. so, wow, that was, you know, and it was a very young cast. It was a, a cast with, you know, as you recall, you know, no major, major stars. The stars were really the show and Agnes Mills choreography. And, um, yeah. <laughs> Does that uh, oh, absolutely. But, you know, but going back, you know, a moment, I mean, you talk about, you know, the role of the understudy and the standby. Those Shirley MacLaine moments are few and far between. I mean, that's just one of those magical, you know, folklore moments. Uh, you mentioned, I mean, Carol Channing for a moment. You know, Carol was a dear friend of mine. And, uh, you know, uh, Sandra Lee 
uh, refers to her, uh, you know, in loving terms. Uh, but uh, God forbid that someone else would get that laugh sometimes. <laughs> so, um, but the experience of being on stage with her, um, and I'm going to pose the same question that I did with Laura McCall, life lessons you learned from working with Carol Channing uh, as uh, both as an actress and as an artist uh, and as a human being. Again, I think the understanding of her job, not only to, to be Laurel I. Lee, but to come out and um, be the initial ticket seller for the show, you know, that part of the business, there was um, things that she had to do uh, as a star. She would come out at the end and, you know, do this little uh, speech. It was pretty much the same speech every night. And her husband would be out, you know, and he would start the laughter if it wasn't there. But we all knew, and she knew this was part of what she did. But like the first week I was on, there was a moment where we were all kind of around her and she came up and had her back to the audience. And it was a moment where she sometimes would adjust something in her costume or whatever, and she would talk to us. Well, she adjusted, she said, you, very good. I like what you're doing. Good it up. And then she went, and then she turned around, you know, and it was like, she totally broke character, but to welcome me, you know, and then, you know, I was like this and I looked at the, my folks and they said, oh, that's pretty good. You know? <laughs> <laughs> she, she knew when to welcome and warm, you know, warmly. Um, yeah. But it's that I'm the star. I know I am, but I'm not really that when the curtain goes down, you know, I'm not no. really that I'm working. Lorelei was a very problematic show because Lorelei was going constantly going through changes and uh, it was like a revolving door of creatives uh, coming going to make that show work. And I don't even think in today's world of theater uh, that the process of getting that show to Broadway uh, would even work in today's world. Um, if you can talk a little bit about what that was doing psychologically to this company, Leroy Reams, very dear friend, Dodie Goodman was a dear friend, uh, and the stories I've heard from both of them uh, about the constant changes with that show. I, w I was one of the last replacements to come in, so I missed so much of that. And, and I walked in, and there were, you know, there, there, you could sense sometimes an exhaustion. You know, when someone else would come in, oh, we're, good. we're going to adjust this. And everybody goes, OK, you know, um, but I had come in. So I was all full of lots and lots of energy. And I had worked with Leroy before. And so, I mean, he was he was always he's a rock. You know, he's just mm -hmm. um, all this, that's not unusual. What happened to Lorelai? What happened to Irene? It, it, it um, I don't know if it happens today because we don't go out on, you know, long um, out of town tryouts. They're very, very costly. And uh, they just don't put the shows. They, they tend to 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 go to a regional theater and kind of work it, you know, and then move it. So it kind of grows as it um, as it moves toward Broadway. Um, do you miss uh, uh, that aspect of the theater? I mean, do you think that that's something that is sorely missing in today's world of theater? And did you like being on the road? Um, I did and I didn't. You know, I had a, a kids I was raising, so it depended on where they were in their life and, you know, whether I would go with a, a nanny or not. You know, if I had a role and a lot of money, I'd, I could take the nanny. Um, but I think I think the most important thing to me was just always watching, watching the process. Um, I probably was judgmental like everybody was, but I was so fascinated with the process. And I, the process has changed. But I'm so proud of musical theater today, of what it has done in the last 20 years. It's being told differently. It sounds different. It looks different. But the stories are getting told. They're they're not afraid to really tackle uh, some um, complicated issues. Um, um, musical theater has always, American musical theater has always kind of done that very subtly. Oh. And I've been teaching or uh, putting together a course on the Pulitzer Prize winning musicals. And so if you start with uh, the icing kind of work toward um, um, Hamilton and the new one, what's the, the new, the last one was the single, uh, it was just awarded last year. Ugh. Oh, um, uh, the, uh, uh, Jagged Pill? No, no, it wasn't Jagged Pill. It's, it's a, a single, uh, a gentleman who, who, uh, uh, the story is about writing, um, uh, a musical and it, I think it was just to open on Broadway, but it had a, um, you know, a smaller run before, but the Pulitzer Prize Committee thought it was very worthy. So I haven't, experience that at all because of COVID. But if you go, if you trace 
um, those, each one of those musicals dealt with something terribly important. And, you know, um, Porgy and Bess didn't, didn't get it. Uh, Oklahoma didn't get it, but these other ones did. Um, musical people are very edgy, really. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you sit down and chat with them, um, the kind of um, Book of Mormon, um, uh, spam a lot. Um, you know, they're funny, they're parodies there, but mm, something's being said. Um, so I'm very proud of the musical theater. Oh, that's wonderful. I want to talk about your course in a few moments, but I want to, you know, well, let's go back for, I mean, from the moment that you've come into theater until what the theater has evolved into now, uh, the theater, the, the world of theater on all levels has changed. And especially I think COVID has shed a light on uh, the past year and a half uh, has opened the doors, the floodgates on so much in our world right now. Uh, and uh, social media, everything has really shown a light on so much. What are some of the biggest uh, changes that you are seeing in uh, major changes in theater? Things that you are really embracing? And what are some of the things that you really miss that were there when you first came into the theater? I think the 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 blending right now of um, uh, the theater in the room and the streaming. Um, there will be since uh, you know Hamilton did it at Disney Plus last summer. Um, there have been other shows. Um, the Camelot I did was was taped, you know, on stage. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, Sweeney Todd was taped on stage, you know, and then presented on TV, which is very different than an adaptation mm -hmm. of adaptation. And I think there's going to be more of that, capturing the show as it is, as it was on stage. Um, yes, there'll be adjustments for camera and everything, but it's going to capture something closer to the original creators. And uh, when you move away from the stage and then you recreate uh, a movie, adapt for the film, you're moving farther and farther away frequently from the original creators. And of course, it's a different uh, expression of the storytelling. So it's going to change a lot of things. But I think we have a wonderful opportunity here to capture for posterity what mm -hmm. the original folks did, what they wanted, and how they, they expressed it. Then, you know, make your movie and then, you know, uh, make Broadway Junior for it, you know. But, but you'll always have that, what, you know, the archival tapings um, at the Lincoln Center, everyone will be able to, to see the archival taping. You know, it, it's, mm -hmm. I think that's very exciting. And then talk about watching the original people um, do their stuff. Uh, oh, that's just, just kind of thrilling. And you know, there'll be more and more, they're already trying to capture everything. Um, I also think that you know, um, they've been writing about, um, as the Broadway's opening up, they're looking at some of the more questionable things in some of these hit shows and adjusting. Uh, I think that is um, because parody and satire are edgy. They're mm -hmm. meant to be edgy. And sometimes if you don't know what's being made fun of, you don't get the joke. And you tell the joke for perhaps truth or reality or this is what they meant, and it isn't. And so I think there's uh, more and more the creative teams are beginning to get that. I mean, they've always gotten it, but now they can fix it. So um, they're not afraid to make changes. I think that's fabulous. What I miss possibly is sometimes um, when we take an old show and we revive it and we make lots of big changes, um, it's hard for an old guy like me <laughs> to see so many huge changes. Um, sometimes I go, oh yeah, great idea. Then I go, oh, why? You know, <laughs> Because my memory was maybe having done the show or witnessed it when it first opened on Broadway was uh, I'm bringing all of that in, you know, and I'm, I'm wanting to recapture it and I can't. I can't. Well, and again, I'm gonna quote Leroy Reams. <laughs> Leroy Reams compares it to making a red velvet cake. I've said this before. He said, we all know what a red velvet cake looks like. We know what it tastes like. But let's say that you say, I'm gonna make a red velvet cake tonight, but instead of this ingredient, this ingredient, this ingredient, I'm gonna replace it with this, this, and this. It better well taste better than the original, otherwise why bother? And I am totally in agreement with that. And I also, I love what Turner Classic Movies is doing uh, with revisiting these films uh, that we know that blackface is bad. But when you see blackface in a film, 
it should have a knee-jerk reaction for all of us. But to have a bumper at the beginning of the film and at the end of the film saying this was the generation that it was placed in and this is what was going on at the time and addressing those issues of the time period. I would love to see talkbacks happening in the theater where the actors can come on and discuss it instead of cutting it completely out as if it never happened. Right. Uh, that's what I want to see happening in the theater. I want people talking about what was going on instead of totally, uh, totally erasing it. Right. Uh, I, I want to go back again. Brigadoon opens. You are, uh, again, a bona fide star. Um, how, you know, a few weeks ago, I interviewed Davis Gaines, and he said, being in this business is like being in a pinball game. Uh, you may think that you're mapping out a career, uh, but you're knocked around like a pinball uh, game. Um, did you have a game plan for your career? And if so, uh, how much on track were you able to stay on track? And how much of your career happened as a result of external circumstances? I think that um, just life gets in the way, whatever your plan is. And, you know, the, the kids have to eat. They keep wanting food. Children? <laughs> What is it? Clothes, toys. So <laughs> your um, your your focus isn't moves away from career into I've got other responsibilities, and so that was something that happened. And then I I got known for this certain sound, uh, and very few people knew I had another sound. So I kept fighting. You know, can I get the audition for? I can sing. I dreamed a dream, but I, I, you know, the the casting people saw me in an HMS Pinafore singing Josephine, so they wouldn't give me an audition. I had to go to Canada to get an audition for Les Mis, and um, and then they heard me sing, and they went, "Oh, didn't know you could do that." Okay, so all those kinds of things happened, and personally, by the time I was ready to move into the next category, they were ready to retire me. That was my feeling. So I pulled away at that point, um, uh, and and then I started paying attention to the, the teaching, you know, which which goes into another thing. And then the teaching brought me right back into the theater, which I thought I had left the actual performing. So the game plans, Richard, they you can have them, but you wake up every morning, they change. <laughs> you know? So, uh, but I think I was so so fortunate with the shows that I did do, the people that I worked with, the the. The, the hysterical things that happened on stage that I can carry with me my whole life and give to, to students. And um, yeah, it's hard. You know, I, I agree with Davis. It, it is not an easy road to hoe. So. so when you made the decision that you wanted to teach uh, and you created your own course now and you've got this course on musical theater, which I, I would love to take the course. Um, and uh, so where is the course going? And, uh, you know, are you coming back to performing? Uh, where are you now uh, as far as what's happening now in your life and career? Well, I've, um, I'm putting the course together. There's a lot of interest in it, you know, but right now I'm, I'm, I'm putting it together. When I was teaching at NYU Steinhardt, I was teaching acting to singers. So I wasn't teaching voice. Everyone thinks, oh, you were teaching voice. No. I was teaching Stanislavski, Uta Hagen, and Shakespeare, you know, to singers and, and coaching from, from, from that point of view. And um, that got me back into performing. Um, I started, I did five mother abbesses while I was at NYU, you know, as long as it worked into the schedule. You know, I understudied Ju um, Judy Kane's Souvenir on Broadway. You know, as long as it worked into the schedule, that was fine. I was surprised. I thought I was done. But it was clear that I was older. It was clear that I had achieved that category of casting and I could still sort of sing. So um, my recent retirement just before COVID had nothing to do with COVID was to go back on stage and do the elder roles and was to, to teach up my own, uh, on my own schedule what I wanted to teach and that was necessarily in the program and the curriculum. So that's kind of where I'm trying to pick it up now. Um, it's, it, it's coming back into it is uh, different for everyone. Broadway is different, um, the programs. Um, I was a founding member of the Musical Theater Educators Alliance which is an organization of people who teach in academia for people who want to be in musical theater all over the world. And they teach it differently depending on what, what does Hamburg need? You know, what, what does London need? What does Shanghai need? You know, what does, 
I don't know, Phoenix needs. So um, uh, these are marvelous people who have all running these program teachings in these programs, um, working with young artists and adopting to adapting to the, all the changes that are coming out right now in musical theater and the needs of the industry. Can these young people step up and fulfill the needs of the industry, which are changing? Uh, you know, is this as you're putting this, is this something that you've been formulating for several years with this course? Um, and if so, is this a course that you eventually will uh, teach other people to be teaching in other universities? I think I love the idea uh, because the American Musical Theater Art Forum uh, is something that I sh think should be taught in uh, theater departments across the country. Um, it, it is in, in many, uh, you know, the MTEA, if you go on their website, you'll see all the, all the schools that have programs and they all have something like introduction to musical theater for the rest of the university. You know, it's one of the general eds that the, that the kids can take. And, um, but generally, you know, sometimes they're a little starting with, you know, uh, maybe some start with Oklahoma, some go back, you know, to the 1800s and, and, um, uh, my thought, because I'm always an old hippie and a little bit of an activist in my youth, um, I'm fascinated by the songs of social significance. You know, what 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 changed in our, why did of the icing get recognized? Why was South Pacific recognized by this writing award? Um, uh, why was Fiorello recognized by this writing award? Why, you know, Hamilton, yeah. Um, it, it just, if you go through, uh, it's it's a mini history of where we were at different moments and the important things that were being addressed in the shows that the um, these writers and, and the, the the prize was given to journalism first and then then um, fiction writers and then and then it took them hmm, twenty years maybe to to award a musical and uh, curiously they awarded the musical to everybody but George Gershwin. Interesting. Only, yes, I mean they they corrected that like in the 1990s, but yes, because music couldn't possibly be the most important element. Um, so they they awarded the lyricist and the book writers, and they're named. <laughs> now, when South Pacific won, um, Hammerstein was listed. <laughs> so um, I mean, as a lyricist, as a book writer, and there was I think Josh Logan was also on that too. So um, now the theater is opening up again. Have you been? Have video. you been back to the theater? Uh, not yet, not yet. But um, there's a pile of things that I'm. Looking. And have you ever, have you ever done cabaret? Fifty four below. Uh, are you interested? I, I in yes. Yeah, I'm working. I'm I'm looking at some things now. There's some really great old lady songs uh, or old men songs that uh, need to be addressed again. I think. Um, and actually, you know, some younger songs that can be reinterpreted. Yes, I am looking. At, uh, I mean, I can still sing a little, interestingly enough. Well, so. I, I can't wait to be there. I can't wait to see you again. It's going to be. <laughs> so, I mean, so where are you now as far as this course? Uh, when do you think that it will be uh, actually uh, being taught? I don't know. You know, it's I, um, um, I'm, I'm putting together a small version of it for um, uh, an, an elder uh, group with the Westchester uh, Community College, and oh, um, wonderful. It's, you know, it's a very truncated version, but they're all fascinatingly interest, interested. So you know, it's a matter of just getting it up. And once I've taught even that, then I can start, um, you know, uh, approaching other schools. And are you because that would be great just to teach one course. And my workshops are the the Michael Chekhov work, um, mm -hmm. the tools, the physical tools of the Chekhov work, and in, in working on songs. Um, and it works brilliantly on songs. So those are the kinds of things that I'd like to teach. Um, and do you think that you would do anything virtually with this? I mean, is this a course that you would open to the general public? Oh, the, the, uh, yeah, yeah. As, as some schools are still teaching virtually, so it, it could, it would be, yeah. When I, when I figure all those complications of Zoom. <laughs> it's, it's a musical theater course, so you've got to play. You know, if you're if you're in a room in a school, you can play the CD. You know, I mean, that's, you know, but you can't do it on Zoom. Um, it's, it's a copyright issue as well as uh, it just sounds awful. So, um, yeah, you know, and if you're in a school, you can just say, okay, the library's got this, go listen to it, you know, uh, and it's a little different. So I'm learning. <laughs> 
Well, if there's anything that I can do to help you, uh, please, you know, and anytime, you, I mean, you always have uh, a seat at my table to come here. Uh, Susan Schulman, uh, thank you uh, uh -huh. for reaching out. Uh, before we wrap up, I always uh, end my show, this is my little homage uh, to James Lipton inside the Actors Studio. Um, he always ended with his questions and I put some questions together. Uh, these are just some random questions that I'm gonna ask you. Um, and the first question is, what single word best describes you? Manic. <laughs> Great. Um, who made the strongest first impression on you in the theater? Dick Van Dyke. Do you want to elaborate on that? He wasn't at all what I expected. I expected a, a very um, a, a kooky, uh, kind of wild, kind of eccentric dancer type, mm -hmm. which he was. He was shy, gentlemanly, kind, um, you know, came up to me immediately. Uh, and, uh, you know, it just, I just, wow, that wasn't what I expected at all. Wow. He was the first major, major um, leading man that, that I had, so. And of course, that was the music man for those who don't know. Um, uh, who has the strongest uh, personality among the people that you know? People that in the I know. Theater? Who has the strongest personality uh, of the people that you know in the theater? Strongest personality, is that interesting? Um, I'm not sure. I had never thought that way. Wow. I'm deeply impressed with Lynn Manuel Miranda. Um, so, I, you know, but a strong personality suggests something else to me. And I think, you know, when I've seen him speak uh, on his work, he's again much quieter than he sometimes presents mm -hmm. himself in the work that he does. Um, but I, I think he's a very impressive person. Oh my God. I'm so, <laughs> uh, he impresses me on so many levels. And if he ever sees or hears this, I would love to sit and chat with him. <laughs> He, you know, is just someone that I would love to sit with. Um, what is, um, and I'm all about celebrating. So no names or a particular situation. Uh, don't give away anything that would put someone on the spot. But what is the biggest injustice that you ever suffered in your career? And how did you get through it? I think, you know, I wasn't recognized for something um, by the person that should have for, for any, it was, a, it was a um, kind of a life altering thing. And um, I got through with a little outside help. Um, it was, I, you know, I, I am manic in my work. You know, my brain is like going all the time. And I was uh, focusing and, and uh, what would they call it, ruminating. And uh, I didn't even understand what that word meant until this, this uh, particular thing. And I think I learned that uh, sometimes we have to go outside of ourselves mm -hmm. uh, to, um, and sometimes it's good that it's not a person who knows you well. Um, and I learned that too. So um, I've, I've learned over the many years of life that there are certain wonderful friends I can go to to vent and to vetch about certain things and certain things shouldn't go to the friends. So yeah, that's my answer. Okay. And what is the most surprising action that you've ever taken in your career? I think it was when I stopped, uh, uh, decided to go back to school and, and train to be a teacher. Um, you know, I, I stopped performing for about six years uh, to go back and finish the degree, uh, the undergrad degree that I had lied about for years. And I finished that at, at um, um, SUNY Purchase and then went on to an MAT, Master of Arts in Teaching uh, in English, thinking I was going to teach high school and then did for two years and then ended up at you know, college level, which was mm -hmm. much better. Um, but I think that that was a huge decision. It was a family decision, and um, and uh, you know I didn't want to go. Didn't want to go, but um, I did want to teach, and I wanted to make sure that I knew what I was doing when I was teaching. I knew my craft, but I didn't really know teaching, mm -hmm. and so I went back to school to learn about that. Okay, and when have you come closest to meeting the devil in this business? Frequently. 
Um, Every corner. <laughs> you know, I'm an actor. I'm a I'm a teacher. I'm a storyteller. So we deal with archetypes all the time, and yeah. uh, you know, the archetype of the devil pops up a lot. Absolutely, I totally agree with you. Uh, what is the greatest thing that you have sacrificed in your career? The greatest thing that I've sacrificed. At this time in my life, I don't think of things that I gave up as sacrifices. Okay. Um, I, you know, they were things that needed to get done. And usually if they needed to get done, then after you know some time, um, I understood why I, I did it. Mm -hmm. So uh, at the moment, you could say sacrifice, but it was a shift of direction or a shift of focus more than, than that. Sacrificial. Great, great way of looking at things. I like that. Um, what do you, uh, oh, I like this question. What sin do you most enjoy committing? Um, oh, what is a bunch? Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm a fairly conservative, boring person, but you, you know, when no one's around. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I think, uh, oh, it's the, the chocolate cake thing. Mm. You know, I think it's, it's, it has, to do with eating. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. And my last question to you is what turned out to be the most useful course that helped you in your career? There was a course that I took at HB Studios um, and actually Alex Corey was in it, um, Susan Watson was in it, um, somebody else, Mary, Mary uh, Saunders Martin. Um, we were down at HB Studios and it was a Shakespeare course and it was mostly young people in New York, uh, you know, studying Shakespeare. And we were four musical ladies uh, in this course. And we learned, all of us learned so much about acting in musicals from understanding how to break down Shakespeare. And I took that with me. I've always been a word person. I, I love uh, good lyrics, complicated lyrics. And I think it was that love of words and, and understanding what's underneath the Shakespeare classical monologue soliloquy uh, that I recognize in all these songs that I sing in musical theater. Um, and so that we can celebrate him or her. Who taught that course? Uh, uh, Aaron Frankel. Aaron okay. Frankel. Not Jane Frankel. Aaron Frankel. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, Meg, this has been such a thrill for me. Don't go anywhere for a moment. I want to thank everybody who is here today. Again, Susan Schulman, thank you, thank you, thank you. I hope you've had as much fun as I have. I just, I, 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 I again, such a fan of yours from the moment I first saw you on stage. And uh, this was such a treat for me. Uh, I thank each and every one of you for being here today. Um, I, and I'm sure I can speak for Meg when I say this, those of us who do what we do, we never take for granted that when you take the time to spend with us, uh, you could be anywhere else. And the fact that you spend it with us, thank you for that. Um, if this is your first time here at Richard Skipper Celebrates, right here on YouTube, I have a little button on my banner and it says, join in the celebration. I replaced the word subscribe with that because the word subscribe to me is a faceless uh, word and you mean more to me than just a subscriber. I want you to be part of my process. So join in the celebration. Uh, hit the like button, leave a comment, let us know what you think, share this with your friends. There are over 325 other artists that I have celebrated on this platform. Uh, check them out. Hopefully there will be 325 more. At least check those out as well. Tell your friends about what we are doing here. Um, and also I end every show by telling everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Go to your Facebook friends list and the second name that pops up today, reach out with a phone call. Not an email message, not a text message, not a private inbox message, a phone call. And let that person know what they mean to you. Because as my dear friend David Friedman always says, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. And I always say, if you're going to go out in a boat, make sure you bring a skipper along. <laughs>
Meg, I'm going to leave the screen and I'm going to give you the stage to yourself and you've got the final word today. Anything that you want to say about anything that we talked about today that you want to build upon, anything that we didn't talk about that you wish that we had, or just a final message that you want to put out to anyone who's watching right now. I thank you for the gifts that you've given to the world and the gifts that you're going to continue to give. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for being who you are and giving us your body of worth. Thank you so much for being here. Thank and you. the stage is all yours. Okay, so I guess I would say to young artists out there, young musical theater artists, watch everybody you can. Um, watch from the wings, watch from uh, the house, um, watch in the rehearsal room, watch on um, the video streams uh, for the live theater things, you know, watch all that. Um, listen to the lyrics, pay attention to what the words say. Um, it's not about long, marvelous, held notes, it's about what the words say are saying with the music. Um, so I would just say, do it. Do whatever it is that you want to do as an artist, do it. Uh, you may find that it's not exactly what you thought you started out to do, but you will find your way. Keep the art going and just enjoy life. God bless.